Well, a very good evening and thank you for joining us on India Business Hour. I'm Ashmit Kumar and here are the headlines that we're tracking at this hour. Sensex and Nifty declined for the sixth day in a row, losing over 2% just this week. Over 8 lakh crore rupees in investor wealth wiped out in the last six sessions. All sectoral indices declined this week. After a surge during the pandemic, retail investors look beyond equities. National data shows that stock exchanges have lost 38 lakh clients in the last six months. Daily average turnover in February is down 38% compared to last year. Zerodha's Nitin Kamath says new users have dropped and the company is finding it hard to generate revenue. No respite for Adani stocks as the group loses over 21,000 crore rupees in market cap today. More than 12 lakh crore rupees wiped out in this month. Supreme Court refuses to gag the media from reporting on the Adani Hindenburg saga. Prime Minister Modi flags the risks to global growth due to high levels of debt in emerging economies at the G20 finance ministers meeting in Bengaluru. A tug of war erupts over the joint statement. Finance ministers of Britain and France say that the statement should not shy away from mentioning the Ukraine war and reprimanding Russia. Air India says it will be hiring over 4,200 cabin crew personnel and 900 pilots as 2023 as it expands its fleet. The announcement comes a week after the airline signed mega deals with Airbus and Boeing for 470 aircraft. National Company Law Appellate Tribunal stays the insolvency proceedings against Z Entertainment, issues notice to Indus and Bank who had filed the insolvency plea. Z argues that they were the corporate guarantor only for a tranche of interest repayment facility on city's debt. It is foolish for a real estate company to order because you can't deal with all, all the people all India. Be where you are. Construction tycoon KP Singh says DLF is content with sticking with Delhi and CR, says it is foolish for a real estate company to operate all across India, also says there were no irregularities in DLF's deal with Robert Vadra, which had come under the CBI scanner during the UPA2 tenure. Ukraine braces for possible fresh attacks as the Russian invasion completes a year. Zelensky tweets that 2023 will be the year of their victory. The United Nations General Assembly passes a resolution demanding Moscow withdraw its troops from Ukraine. China calls for a political settlement to end the war. Former Mastercard CEO and Indian-American Ajay Banga nominated by the US to lead the World Bank. US President Joe Biden says Banga is uniquely equipped to lead the bank at this critical moment. Supreme Court refuses to hear a PIL seeking menstrual leaves for female students and working women, says the matter fell within the domain of policy. CGI says that if employers were compelled to grant menstrual leave, it may disincentivize them from hiring women. The court suggests that the petitioner approach the Ministry of Women and Child Development. Well, let's start with the market action of the day. Sensex and Nifty declined for the sixth straight day, even though the losses today were limited. Nonetheless, both major indices have lost 2.5% this week, erasing all the gains made in the previous three weeks. All in all, nearly 8.5 lakh crore rupees of investor wealth has been wiped out in the last six trading sessions. Well, sticking with the markets after a surge in retail participation during COVID, data shows investors are now looking beyond equities. National Stock Exchange has in fact lost 38 lakh clients in the last six months alone. Daily average turnover in February is down 38% compared to last year. Anuj Singhala joins us with more details. Anuj. The number of retail clients with NSC, that's down 38 lakhs in last six months. 38 lakh clients... Uh, have actually disappeared uh, from the NSC. They've stopped trading, and the number of N the retail or HNI share in cash market is down to 44 percent. This number was a mind-boggling 66 percent. 66 percent of the volume two years back post-COVID were getting generated from the retail and HNI. Now this is NSC data, but I'm giving credit to uh, uh, a Twitter account, uh, a digital blogger, because uh, 
this guy really helped me a lot uh, in terms of this data and it's only fair that he gets the credit but that's the the big number the other big number what's happening in the cash market turnover just look at that the daily average turnover which had reached 81235 crores in february daily average has now reduced to 50384 crores which is a drop of 38% now this doesn't mean that people have lost interest in stock markets people have lost interest in investments but there is some interest in market overall look at what's happening to the options turnover this is the index options and we are only taking premium into account not even the overall uh, notional turnover the premium which used to be 17485 crores in february that's gone up to 53562 crores 206% growth no wonder the sebi is a bit worried especially considering that 90% of uh, fndo traders actually end up losing money and that's why this data is very important and now the reason for that because from october 2021 peak the market's not given you anything the nifty is down 5% and that's not even telling you the true picture the nifty mid cap is down 8.2% and the nifty next 50 which is where I, again a lot of portfolios are benchmarked to it's actually down 16% and equities are not giving you a return the other thing is happening remember in 2021 the fixed income market was not giving you anything the repo rate was 4% now repo rate has gone up to 6.5% and it's still rising and what fixed income is giving you is it's generating risk free return of 7 to 8% when in broking you know i think i somehow feel that we've kind of hit a plateau uh, uh because the new user growth has dropped the existing user growth uh, existing users aren't really you know adding more uh, Uh, as such so i think i think the big challenge is that while india is a large country uh, we're still a poor country and the real problem to solve in this country is to kind of you know uh, get rich inclusively you know get get a lot more indians uh, you know to a position where they can actually spend money Well, meanwhile, there's no respite for the Ani stocks as they continue to fall, and the group's market capitalization is now closer to seven lakh crore rupees. Now, it's exactly one month since the Hindenburg report raised several red flags, and since then, the stocks have taken a beating. Seven out of the ten group stocks ended in the red uh, today, losing more than twenty-one thousand crore rupees in market capitalization. The group's value currently stands at just above seven lakh crore rupees. Since the Hindenburg report was released, it has lost more than twelve lakh crore rupees in market cap. The Supreme Court today meanwhile refused to gag the media from reporting on the Adani Hindenburg saga. A bench headed by the Chief Justice of India said that it will not restrain the media. These comments were issued after advocate Emil Sharma mentioned his application seeking an injunction on the media from reporting on the case for listing and hearing by the Apex Court. Well, shifting focus now, emerging nations debt vulnerabilities and the Russia Ukraine war are expected to feature prominently on the agenda as the first key event under India's G20 presidency kicks off in the city of Bengaluru finance ministers and central bank governors from G20 nations and top executives of leading international financial institutions have all gathered to brainstorm on roles of multilateral development banks climate financing and debt situation among others prime minister narendra modi called on the nations to address risks to global growth due to high levels of debt in emerging economies you represent the leadership of global finance and economy at a time when the world is facing serious economic difficulty staying with G20 a tug of war has erupted over the text for the G20 joint statement in fact the finance ministers of Britain and France tell us that the statement should not shy away from mentioning the Ukraine war and reprimanding Russia uh, Parishit Lutra gets us more details Parishit this is quite a contentious issue especially the different set of stakeholders that we have among the G20 nations what else are you picking up 
Well, it is the anniversary, one year anniversary of the Ukraine-Russia war and it's very clear that there is a divide over the G20 communique or the outcome document. The G7 is pushing for strong language to condemn Russia's role in uh, the Ukraine uh, uh, conflict which has been on for uh, 12 months now. They have said that the use of uh, or threat of nuclear weapons is absolutely inadmissible. This threat, this era cannot be a war. The Ukraine war has caused immense human suffering and immense loss to the global economy. They have also said that the there can be no departure from the Bali communique when it comes to the wording on the Ukraine-Russia war. Uh, we've got to know from sources that uh, Russia and China have suggested or are trying to dilute the text on uh, the Ukraine uh, uh, paragraphs, especially uh, in the communication. And G7 leaders have told us here uh, at this meeting, uh, the negotiators from these countries have told us that any dilution from the Bali text on Ukraine will not be acceptable and G7 will not go uh, give its go-ahead. So even yesterday, there was a late-night meeting which went on till about 1 a.m. in the night. We believe that the negotiators are still in, the, uh, in this uh, room inside uh, the convention center at JW Marit here in Bang Bengaluru. And remember, these meetings began at 7 a.m. in the morning and those negotiations still continue. The other contentious issues are debt restructuring and how the debt uh, impact in countries like uh, Zambia and Sri Lanka will be brought down. Differences over strengthening multilateral development banks as well. But coming to a consensus on the communique remains the biggest challenge for the Indian government, for the Ministry of External Affairs and the Ministry of Finance as well. Nirmala Sitaraman has hosted 10 bilateral meetings on the sidelines uh, of uh, this G20 meeting. India has also told us and government sources telling us that they will stick with the Bali text and they will not allow any dilution of the Bali text to take place whatsoever. Back to you. Well, we are very clear that it would be a big mistake to uh, make the text any weaker uh, than it was at the leaders' meeting agreed in Bali. And, uh, and I think it's widely understood that on the anniversary of the uh, terrible invasion of Ukraine, that would send exactly the wrong signal. Um, you know, I want to congratulate the government of India. I think they've done a fantastic job putting together this summit. It's obviously a very difficult international situation. And to have a G20 meeting in which you have uh, the United States, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, Russia around the same table is, is very challenging. Well, we cannot water down a communique that has been decided by uh, the head of state. And we cannot water down a communique which makes very clear that we all condemn the illegal and brutal aggression of uh, Ukraine. I would like to uh, quote uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, when he says, it is not an era of war. He is fully right. And we should uh, stick to uh, the wise sentence of Prime Minister Modi. This is not an era of war. And it would be a mistake not to have a ceasefire not to uh, put that war to an end. Well, there you have it. Diplomats from the G20 nations in a huddle. Well, you can catch all the action from the G20 summit at 9.30 p.m. right here on CNBC TV 18. Well, here's also a quick check at the other key stories that we're tracking. The National Company Law Appellate Tribunal stayed insolvency proceedings against the Z Entertainment and issued a notice to the Indusind Bank who had filed the insolvency application. Z argued that they were the corporate guarantor only for a tranche of interest repayment facility on Citi's debt. Air India says it will be hiring over 4,200 cabin crew personnel, over 900 pilots in 2023 as it expands its fleet. The announcement comes a week after the airline signed mega deals with Airbus and Boeing for 470 planes. Well, another big newsmaker this evening, K.P. Singh, the chairman emeritus of real estate company DLF, won the Lifetime Achievement Award at the EY Entrepreneur of the Year Awards. Singh sat down with Shireen Bhan for a candid conversation. He said that DLF is content to sticking with the Delhi NCR region and added that it is foolish for a real estate company to operate all across the country. He also said that there were no irregularities in DLF's deal with Robert Vadra, which had come under the CBI scanner during the UPA2 tenure. Real estate, people don't understand, is the most complicated business. Real estate is divided into two parts. One is land, purchase land and zoning it. That is the biggest, 90% problem. Once you have land, building is easy. No, there you can have building carried out by... No, it is the land. The question is when you get to land, 
purchase an assembly to make a bigger area. All kind of characters come, mafias and all. You deal with them. Politics come. Now, we in DLF decided at that time. We are best at in NCR only. So we actually expanded. Then we have, uh, Rajiv was very smart. Within two years, we thought that is not our forte. We can't deal with the political and all the people there. So, so he just came in, except I think Chennai and Hyderabad, a couple yeah. of people, but not all India. It is, it is foolish for a real estate company to order because you can't deal with all, all the people in all India. Be where you are. There's been many controversies over the last 70 plus years. Uh, I, I don't need to recount them. You're, no, fully, aware, talk, no, you're no. fully aware no, of no, them. No, no, no. You know, from, we've had conversations about your run-ins with Bansi Lal for no, for no fault of yours. Two, of course, uh, what happened as far as the Robert Vadra matter was concerned, where, Ask there, was, any question. There, where there was the, where there are FIRs, the matter is in court, a commission was set up, etc. What have been the big learnings there, as far as a real estate company operating in India within the parameters of the law, but also having run-ins with political parties, politicians? What's been the big le lesson? Big there? learning is which I practiced. First, you never get into involved in any business relationship with any politician. You should have politicians as your friends, well-wishers. But not you should yourself not be in politics. I had, given, I had one chance in 84 when the whole village community, that I bought the land, and this and the biggest success, they all came with a, 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 a unanimous choice for member parliament. So I talked to my late father-in-law, he said, Vita, you don't have to Politics and business don't go together. So I was frankly slightly tempted because the whole unopposed I would have been. But for what? DLF would not have come there. there the same thing. So I decided no, two things will not. We will do our business with political friends as we do with good relationship, well wishes, but never cross the line. Mm. DLF, has, I can tell you, please take it from me, we have never crossed the line of doing business against any law. So, you know, you're saying that you've always knowingly uh, not broken any law, but there have been instances, even when it comes yeah. back to the IPO, for instance, and there was a SEBI order, which of course then got overturned yeah. by yeah. SAT, but yeah. there was a SEBI order yeah. Yeah. which barred you from accessing the capital markets, which penalized you and six other senior executives of the company yeah. Yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. So today, as you look back, are there, but, things, but that, are there things now that you believe are non-negotiable? For instance, you said that there will be no dealings with politicians yeah, of, no. of any kind. No. So do you regret the deal done with Robert Vadra? Not at all. This is not regret. My God, without that, DLF would have lost a massive money. Please understand the business work. You've got nothing to do. I, by the way, I've only played one day golf. I don't know the gentleman. Robert Vadra is a businessman. Mm. He's not a politician at that time, by the way. Businessman, yeah, Basically, they know how to make money, not how to lose. So in our business, it's very easy. I must have made maybe 40, uh, 40 50, 10 times millionaires than what does. Well, you can catch that entire conversation with DLF's KP Singh at 10 p.m., where he opens up about his business, life, and finding romance at the age of 93. Well, with that, it's time now to slipping into a very short break, but we leave you with the visuals of the EY Entrepreneur of the Year Awards, where Sajjan Jindal won the top honour. We're back in two minutes. The EY Entrepreneur of the Year 2022, Mr. Sajjan Jindal of JSW Group. Tonight, I accept this award not just on behalf of myself, but on behalf of all the entrepreneurs who are making a difference in the world. Let us continue to innovate, to solve problems, and to create value for our customers. EY Entrepreneur of the Year Lifetime Achievement Award winner 2022, Mr. K.P. Singh.
Welcome back. Now, the Supreme Court has refused to hear a PIL seeking menstrual leaves for female students and working women. The court said that the matter fell squarely within the domain of policy. That's not all. CJI Chandrachur observed that if employers were compelled to grant menstrual leaves, it may disincentivize them from hiring women at all. Archana Solanki gets us more. Archana. Thank you, Ashmit. Uh, while dismissing a plea on menstrual leave for women, the Chief Justice of India, D.Y. Chandrachur, said, and I quote, I agree, if you compel employers to grant menstrual leave, it may disincentivize them from hiring women, unquote. The plea filed under Article 32 sought leave for students and women employees across the country. The Supreme Court said it's a policy matter and it would be appropriate if the petitioner approached Women and Child Development Ministry. The issue of paid period leave has reignited the conversation around the world, with a recent headline coming in from Spain that became the first European country allowing for paid menstrual leave. While passing the law, Spain's equality minister said, and I quote, no more going to work with pain. Without such rights, women are not full citizens, unquote. A large section of the society is still divided over the issue. The advocates of period leave assert that many women suffer from extreme symptoms such as heavy bleeding, severe cramping, fatigue and nausea and that they need to rest. While the others say, in fact they warn, that such a move far from liberating women could prompt employers to prioritize men when hiring. So which other countries have period leaves? Indonesia, Japan, South Korea, Zambia all have these leaves. In India, recently, Kerala gave menstrual leaves to female students enrolled in colleges and universities. Bihar, too, has been given two days off to its women employees since 1992. The companies like Baiju's, Zomato, Culture Magazine and a few others have also taken similar steps. But reports suggest that women often refrain from availing such leaves for the fear of being judged. A research paper says that such a move contributes to menstrual stigma and perpetuates gender stereotypes negatively, impacting the wage gap. Back to you. Well, for the very first time, a person of Indian origin is likely to head the World Bank. In fact, a former CEO of MasterCard, Ajay Banga, has been nominated by the U.S. The 63-year-old stepped down from his role at MasterCard two years ago. Jagruti here uh, profiles Ajay Banga's career path that took him from a cantonment area in Pune to one of the most coveted jobs in the world of world finance. Meet Ajay Banga former MasterCard CEO and potentially the first Indian origin person to lead the World Bank in the near future. US President Joe Biden nominated Banga to succeed David Malpass as the World Bank President. President Joe Biden in a statement said and I quote, Ajay Banga has critical experience in mobilizing public-private resources to tackle the most urgent challenges of our time including climate change. For nearly eight decades, the U.S. president, which is the largest stakeholder in the World Bank, has picked its president, though the bank's board still needs to officially appoint Banga. Born in an army family, Banga completed his early education in Pune, pursued his undergrad in economics from St. Stephen's College and later moved to Ahmedabad for his postgrad from the Indian Institute of Management. Lucky to be one of those in the earlier days, but there were people before me. My once made a joke at Vibrant Gujarat in my first year that I was truly the made in India guy. I studied <laughs> in India, educated in India. I have no education overseas. I am a graduate of St. Stephen's and, and I am Ahmedabad, as you know. I haven't even been to an executive education program in a country overseas. I believe that that's a tribute to the quality of education I got in my growing years in India and to the, to the kind of people I got the chance to learn from. In an illustrious career spanning three decades, Banga worked in Nestle, PepsiCo and Citibank. But his stint in MasterCard as its CEO is the most remarkable one. Under Banga's leadership, MasterCard's revenue nearly tripled and market cap surged to more than 15 times. Kill cash became his motto. The, the Ajay Banga example from MasterCard is one of my favorites. Uh, he came in in 2011. Uh, by the way, MasterCard was $17 billion in, master, uh, in market cap when he took it, took it over. When he stepped down, it was north of $300 billion in market cap. So quite the journey. Speaking to CNBC TV 18 in 2020, Banga shared his vision on regulating global finance. During the financial crisis 10 years back, the global world created something called the FSP, the Financial Stability Board, which helped uh, governments around the world right. 
figure out the rules around financial services to ensure that there was an arbitrage across markets. Maybe we need something like this for AI, privacy, digital taxation, the digital world, data, that whole space, something like a data and technology board. In 2016, Banga was awarded the Padma Shri by then President late Pranab Mukherjee, which is the fourth highest civilian award in India. The World Bank presidency will be another feather in his cap. In Mumbai with Jagruti Potpore, Shilpa Rani Peta. Well, that's all the time that we have for. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of India Business R. Thank you so much for watching. News and updates continue right here on CNBC TV 18.